In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. One of the most famous buildings in Rome is called the Pantheon. The Pantheon is a large, round structure that has a famous dome as a roof with a hole in the middle of it. The Pantheon was built by a pagan emperor as a temple that was consecrated to all the various gods throughout the entire Roman Empire. In fact, that is why it is called the Pantheon, because when you translate the Greek, that literally means all gods. This allowed people from all walks of life to offer incense to the gods they liked, their favorite gods. But in actuality, they were actually worshiping demons that were behind these gods. Remember what it says both in the Psalms and also in St. Paul's letter, one of his letters. He clearly taught that, quote, the gods of the heathens are devils. Pagans worship devils, whether they realize it or not. But with, with the rise of Christianity, Catholicism, things began to change quickly. Pagan public worship was prohibited in Rome by the middle of the 4th century A.D. The Pantheon and other various pagan temples were closed and boarded up by order of the emperor at that time, who would have been Christian. Eventually, however, many of these abandoned buildings, including the Pantheon itself, were consecrated and turned into Catholic churches. The government, history tells us, gave the Pantheon over to the Pope for the purpose of worshiping the one true God in three divine persons, as well as venerating all the holy saints. One historian wrote the following quote, the old temple called the Pantheon, after the pagan filth had been removed, was made into a church in honor of the Holy Virgin Mary and all the martyrs, so that the commemoration of all the saints could take place, unquote. Christ had conquered Rome, and his church militant had turned the idolatrous Pantheon into the church of Santa Maria ad Martires, or the Basilica of St. Mary and the Martyrs. The pagan filth, as the historian tells us, had been removed, while cartloads, literally, of martyrs' relics were brought into the newly consecrated church. Niches that were once filled with demonic idols were replaced with devotional statues in honor of Saints Agnes, Agatha, Cecilia, Saints Lawrence, Sebastian, Marcellinus, you name them, all martyrs who witnessed to the true God and the true faith with their blood. In a way, that basilica of St. Mary and the Martyrs, formerly the Pantheon, that basilica would now be a true Pantheon, since all the martyrs, all the saints, all the true godly ones would be given true honors and veneration. Think what happens to us by the gift of sanctifying grace at our baptisms. Mere men are divinized. We don't appreciate what happens to us at baptism. Mere men are deified. They're made into gods with a small g. We literally become adopted children of God the Father in Christ, and we can call God our Father and mean it because we share in Christ's sonship. Supernatural life, divine life has been given to us at baptism and has transformed us into followers of Christ, into godly men far higher than any god who stood atop a Mount Olympus at one time. I mean, what is Athena or Venus in comparison with the Blessed Mother? What is Zeus or Jove in comparison with St. Joseph? Yes, a true pantheon now exists in Rome as the relics of countless martyrs are rendered their proper veneration of godly men who died for Christ. You know, before the Son of God came to earth, before the Holy Ghost was poured forth in abundance on Pentecost Sunday, before the saints started doing their wondrous works as Christ's instruments, the world was filled with idolatry and superstition. The false gods, the demons reigned unjustly over pagan, blind-speaking men. Tyranny and oppression reigned. 
the most revolting of vices were practiced and promoted. Prior to the establishment of Christianity and the making of the saints, the sick and unfortunate were neglected, treated with contempt, seen as cursed by the gods. Fate had decided they would be sick and would be uncared for. And even the most civilized of the pagans still had no supernatural charity. And therefore, there was no or little attempt to provide refuge for the suffering and for the destitute. Torture and the cruelest methods of execution were lawful. There's no charity when there's no grace. Violent wars were fought without the least concern for justice or for chivalry. And yes, before the coming of the wisdom incarnate, the word made flesh, prior to the coming forth of the Holy Ghost with his holy waters, half, half the world's population were enslaved. But with Christ, his apostles, and his holy church and her holy saints, slowly but surely, light would be brought to those in darkness. Life-giving waters from the side of Christ would bring forth the spirit that would renew the face of the earth. The people of the true God built glorious temples that soared above every other building, as well as constructing monasteries that housed and consecrated men and women dedicated to the worship of the Holy Trinity, serving God in religious life. And Christians began to build hospitals. That's how they began. Christianity built the first hospitals, charitable institutions, orphanages, and universities come from the Catholic Church. They were built because men were being lifted up. Marriages were for life. And infidelity and perversions were condemned and were illegal and punished. Cruel methods of execution were banned, beginning with crucifixion. No man could be crucified again. Slavery was little by little abolished. Wars, though still fought, we live in a fallen world, had rules of engagement, just war theories. An abortion and infanticide, so accepted in the pagan world, were condemned as unspeakable crimes. Women who were denied so much dignity in the non-Christian world would be placed upon a pedestal and even serenaded by troubadours in the Christian world. And yes, marriage was between one man and one woman and not the abomination of Sodom in our midst. Therefore, the world became better, a more tender, gentle, and civilized place in which to live because supernatural, transforming life was given to men. Keeping whatever was true and good from the pagan world, Christian scholars and artists added the gift of faith to the patrimony of the ancients and brought forth the greatest music, the greatest art, the greatest literature, the greatest learning, until a height of civilization was reached hitherto unseen. And at the foundation of it all was the traditional Latin mass, where clerics, religious, and laity, all saints in the making, worshipped the true God in the true way and literally ate and drank of the word made flesh. In short, the false gods, the demons were cast out of society, exorcised, and the saints came marching in. But you know, like the demon mentioned in the Holy Gospel by our dearest Lord, you know, that demon who goes out of a man, forced out of a man, and goes off into exile, the demons want to return. They seek to repossess the man, if you will. The return of the gods of the pantheon, in other words. The return of the demons to repossess society. And what did our Lord say when he gave that particular parable from the gospel? He said, quote, he, the demon, goeth out and taketh with him seven other demons more wicked than himself. And entering in, they dwell there. And the last state of the man being repossessed the last state of society, becomes worse than the first. Over the last few decades, society has experienced tremendous decay, spiritually, morally, intellectually. As the ancients often said, 
The corruption of the best is the worst. The corruption of the best is the worst of all. From the heights of Christian civilization, we have fallen to the depths of depravity, previously unsounded. A culture of death reigns as we sacrifice aborted babies to the false god Moloch. Sodom and Gomorrah is now mainstream, and the goddess Ishtar and Venus promotes the most abominable impurities. And yes, the golden calf, the bull, is found not just on Wall Street signaling unbridled greed, but a nation's general apostasy from God. And do we need more proof that somehow the gods, the demons, have returned to repossess Western society? Consider what a great mystic, blessed Francis Palau, 19th century mystic who had a vision seeing all the thrones of Europe, all the seats of power in Europe were occupied by demons. All governments occupied by demons. That was his vision back in the 19th century. What about now? Do we need proof that the gods have returned? That the pantheon has been reestablished? Recently, a large eight-foot golden statue was added to the top of a main New York City courthouse. That courthouse had statues of Moses, all the great lawgivers of old, but now there's an idol that's been put atop of that courthouse, an idol of a naked golden woman with braids, fashioned into horns, coming out of her head and twisted tentacle-like arms and legs. It's not a human person from history, no. It's a god. It is a likeness of a female goddess that stands defiant against those who would eliminate the right to abortion. That's why it was put up there. Observers, in fact, have commented that the statue reminds one of the demonic. There's no other way to look at that statue than it's a demon on top of the courthouse. The artist who created the piece provides us with the real meaning of the statue. Quote, she is a fierce woman and a form of resistance, the artist says. The artist continued, with the reversal of Roe v. Wade, there's a purpose for this statue. With the reversal of Roe v. Wade, there was a setback to women's constitutional progress. The statue or the idol has been given the name now, N-O-W, because women's ability to have abortions is at risk now. A goddess, literally, on a throne on top of a courthouse in the United States. We've got to realize there's something deeper going on here than just the reversal of various judicial decisions. What does St. Paul write in one of his letters? St. Paul writes, quote, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, not so much human beings that are the issue. But we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, unquote. A modern author named Jonathan Kahn wrote a book recently called The Return of the Gods. In the pages of the book, he asked the question, it's a good question to ask, is it possible that behind what is taking place in America, the whole Western world really, lies a mystery that goes back to the gods of the ancient world and that they now have returned. They were cast out, Pantheon was cleared out of that pagan filth, have they come back? The pagan Pantheon has returned where the demons receive incense while the cult of the saints has seemingly been cast out of society. Therefore, there's not simply moral decay and corruption occurring in the modern West. No, there's demonic infiltration. Many of us are aware of a moral crisis in our land, as well as a crisis of faith within the very membership of the church. But you know, always... 
so important to remember. The ultimate crisis that we face is always a crisis of saints. Every crisis the church has ever faced, every crisis the world faces is a crisis of saints. We need saints in our midst. St. Francis of Assisi changed the entire face of the earth when he lived back in the 13th century. We need heroic faith in a very unheroic, dissipated world. We need a pantheon, a pantheon of grace-filled witnesses who are divinized and deified by supernatural life. They live a new way of life, a resurrected way of life. They've crucified themselves. In an age of moral weakness, we need those who practice heroic virtue in their daily lives. The real danger to society is not merely a lack of virtue, but a lack of heroism. We need heroes today. So let us live this Lenten season that is coming up. Let us live it well by being willing to be heroic in our prayers, heroic in our penances, and yes, heroic in our charity towards others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.